The four of us walked back into the gardens, and towards the long buildings that reminded me of classrooms. Dr. Thurston led us past two rows of growing trays and glassed-off rooms with biohazard signs on them, until we reached a door with the legend Hadrian L. Thurston, M.D. on it. The doc unlocked his office, and we all piled into the cozy space. It was bigger than our security cubicle, but not by much. Most of the space was taken up by bookshelves and the mahogany desk that Thurston planted himself behind. Carl stood at his right, and I took a seat across from him as Randy leaned against the wall near the door. Randy looked tired and unhappy to be there, but I guess when Carl called you, you answered your phone. I don't think I've ever talked a lot about Carl. He's a big bald guy, muscular through the chest, and he's got tattoos on his arm that lead me to believe he might have been in the Navy or the Marines. He wore a handgun on his hip like it had grown there, and I could see the strap of some kind of rifle over his shoulder. The glasses he wore always looked a little fake, like a set piece to make him look approachable. And as he crossed his arms over his chest and looked at me, I felt like a kid who's gotten called to the principal's office. So, Dr. Thurston said, you've met the Brandy Low. The what? I asked, the word sounding furry in my mouth. The Brandy Low, the pale lady's servants. She uses them as her soldiers and emissaries, but their numbers are usually low. We normally only have to fight four or five of them, and usually not till summer. We were going to ease you into that part of the job, but it appears you'll have to be thrown in with both feet. She's gathering power again, it seems, and rather than just sacrificing her followers, she appears to be recruiting them. Wait, you knew she was kidnapping people? Carl looked ashamed, but Thurston's mouth turned down in a sullen grimace. It was never very many, and it brought on the constant summers that make the gardens thrive. Usually only takes about eight or ten a year, and we're up to eight already, spring just beginning. This has gone on long enough, and if we don't act now, we may never have another chance. It may be too late already, but I hope not. He turned his full attention back to me, and his regard was more than a little uncomfortable. Tell me what you saw. Don't leave out anything. If we have to go to war with this thing, I need all the information I can get. So, I told him what I knew, and by the time I was done, Gabe had come back. He interrupted my telling as he came into the office, talking about how the police hadn't been able to find anything, but Thurston shushed him so he could go on. When I finished my story, the old man looked thoughtful. They are further along than I'd thought they would be. She's been planning this for years, drawing her power and placating me even as she makes her plans to escape. Sir, what's she planning? Carl asked. They're building her a conduit. Whatever those old priests, or whatever they were, did to keep her locked inside that statue, she's trying to break it. She wants to walk the material plane again. And who could blame her? He looked up at Carl, assessing him for a long moment. Can we get any more help? Carl scratched his chin, seeming to run through their options. Harlow and his boys said they wouldn't help us after last year's debacle. Romeo owes me a favor, but it will take weeks to get him in his unit here without raising suspicion. Russell and his Minutemen could be persuaded, but it would take grease, and lots of it. Thurston nodded, his smile returning, though it looked strained. Sounds like we might be on our own this year, then. Might be time to come up with another plan, I suppose. Carl shrugged. We've held out with less. You and I held that island one year, as I recall. Thurston cackled. Yes, but we were both five years younger then. He turned back to me, but I believe he was assessing all three of us as his blue eyes bore into the troops he had. I won't lie, boys. What we're suggesting will be dangerous. This is nothing like what we've faced in the past and we all might very well become sacrifices for her to step over. If that's the case, then that's the case, I suppose. But I won't ask the rest of you to throw your lives away. If you stand with Carl and I, 
I can promise you both that the garden will never forget what you've done. I'll never forget what you've done, he said, putting emphasis on the last. I'm in, Randall said, and I was surprised at how fast he agreed. He didn't even know what he was going to be asked to do. Or did he, I thought to myself. Randall had been here for a few years at least, like Chuck. Maybe this wasn't the first time he'd had to do things like this. I looked at him to try to get some clarity on what exactly was going on here, but he didn't seem to want to look me in the eye. I took it to mean this wasn't his first rodeo, and told the doc that I was in too. Gabe didn't take much convincing after that. He was young and wanted to be seen as an equal. With that, Dr. Thurston had his devotees. The doc smiled, pulling a pad of paper over as he detailed his plan. We'll close the park today and reconvene tonight. Carl and I will get everything ready so that we don't walk in with our pants down. We'll go back tonight and parley with her. My father always kept her at bay, and if we put down a few of her friends, she'll see reason. I must have made a face, because Dr. Thurston laughed. <laughs> Don't worry, kid. I have no intention of leading us into a suicide mission. I've got a trick up my sleeve, something that kept my father from succumbing to her little pets for decades. We'll put on a show of force, let her know who's boss, and the status quo will be maintained. Everyone get some sleep and meet at the gate at midnight. We'll get ready and go hold court and be open again for the weekend. She's had her pound of flesh this year, and it's time that came to an end. We dispersed after that, daylight mere hours away. Carl and Dr. Thurston stayed to make plans as Gabe and Randy and I left to go get the latter's SUV. Gabe was all a chatter about the night to come, but Randy looked like he didn't want to say much. I walked with them as far as the parking lot, the police cars and ambulances now gone, and told him I'd see him tomorrow. See you later, Gabe said, but Randy asked me to wait. He looked at me, his, his mouth opening and closing, but he seemed unsure of what he wanted to say. It was like he'd walked into a room and forgotten what he was looking for. Nah, that, that's not quite right. It was more like he had noticed the elephant in the room but didn't know how to tell me that it was right there. He kept just opening and closing his mouth for a few seconds, Gabe telling him to come on that he wanted to get back home, before he shook his head and said it was nothing. We'll see you tomorrow, he said, hopping in and pulling out of the parking lot. I got in my own car and left too. It'd be nice to get some night sleep for once. April 7th. I woke up around noon to a text from Carl. Don't bring any firepower tonight. I can provide you with one. Meet at the front gate at 12 p.m. on the dot. I wouldn't eat beforehand. Sometimes these things are best done on an empty stomach. The rest of the day seemed to drag by. I tried to sleep some more, but it wasn't happening. I tried to pass the time with video games or TV, but it was like I just couldn't get into anything. My brain seemed to hyper-focus on what we were going to do tonight which was strange since I had no idea what we were actually going to do. Were we attacking the things I'd seen yesterday? Were we going to threaten the marble statue with guns? I didn't know, and it made me anxious. I was no soldier, and I'd never experienced anything like this. When it finally got dark, I got in my car and drove to the botanical gardens. It was 7.30, but I couldn't stand to be in my house anymore. Despite Carl's warning, I stopped for fast food on the way. It was a sucky last meal, but it was comforting somehow. I ate it in the parking lot, watching the benign walls of the brooding structure as I sat at rest. It looked so quiet, but I was sure they were already moving around in there. The sign they had hung on the wall read, Closed for Family Emergency, and I wondered if it would still be there tomorrow. The park could be closed for longer than expected, depending on the outcome of tonight's events. I hoped it would go well, and I was comforted somehow by the knowledge that Dr. Thurston and Carl had done this before. Somehow, as I sat there worrying about all this, I fell asleep like a kid waiting for New Year's. I didn't wake up again until someone tapped their knuckles on the glass of my driver's side window. 
Carl seemed amused to have found me snoozing. Hope you got your wits about you, kid. It's almost time to go. I climbed out, looking around to see everyone else standing by the gate. Doc wanted a word with everybody. Head on over while I get our equipment out of the truck, he said with a little wink. I nodded, heading over to the gate to meet with the others. Randy was smoking, Gabe chattering animatedly to the two older men, and Thurston nodded as I approached. They all looked a little nervous, but we all seemed ready for what was coming. At least, I thought we were. Good to see you, kid. Now that you're here, let's go over the plan. Under no circumstances, he said, looking pointedly at Gabe when he said it, are we to go in guns a-blazing. We're going to parlay to offer a renewal of existing deals with the pale lady. If it comes to bloodshed, then we will, but I'd prefer to remain civil. She's been willing to talk the last few times, and I want to keep the lines of communication open. Randy, you take up the rear with Carl. Kid, you take up my side. Gabe, catch my other side. We'll head in and get this done so we can all be fresh when we open tomorrow. You said you had a little something up your sleeve, Randy mentioned, tossing his cigarette as he watched the old man carefully. Mind bringing the rest of us up to speed? Dr. Thurston looked at him, and I thought for a moment that he looked a little distrustful. I'll keep that till the time's right, if it's all the same to you, Randy. Carl, are you ready with the gear? Yes, sir, Carl coughed, and I jumped, not having heard him come back. He had a big green duffel bag over one shoulder, and as he opened it, he took out several pump-action shotguns. They were a lot nicer than anything I had at home, and when I checked the slide, it appeared it had been preloaded. He handed me a handful of shells and told me to put them in my left pocket. Gabe chuckled as he took it, the kid probably having never handled anything quite that big. Randy accepted his without much comment, and the five of us set off. The park was quieter than usual, the Muzak gone and the water features silent. It took a few minutes to put my finger on it, but I realized that the trees had been silenced as well. I'd gotten so used to hearing facts about local trees that their absence should have been obvious right away but I was so keyed up that I guess I hadn't noticed. The whole garden seemed to be holding its breath to see how this would turn out, and as the lily pond came closer and closer, I saw them arrayed before the concrete plinth. The objects they had built were strange. Sculptures of odd geometry and peculiar angles dotted the pond. Before the plinth was what looked like a small stone house with a window that peeked out onto the world. From that window, I could see the statue, and as we approached, it turned its neck gratingly and looked at us. Gabe flinched noticeably, but this was just a typical evening for me. Ah, my jailer has come to parley. What do you want, old man? Dr. Thurston stepped into the pool, and the four of us followed him. I have come to renegotiate our deal, Thurston said, smiling placidly. Renegotiate? The deal was ten years, and then I would walk the plane again. I have kept my end of the bargain, but like all humans, you are grasping. Our deal is complete, mortal, and I am free to walk the earth. Not so fast, Thurston said. Allow me a chance to renegotiate our deal. It was never a part of the deal that you would hunt so well, but you have. It was never a part of the deal that you would take so many to fill your ranks. But you have. You have not suffered in this time. I have made you a fine cage to amuse yourself and given you shelter from... Do not speak his name. What I'm saying is, you're comfortable here. Why not stay a little longer? You are immortal, and I am old. What's a little more time of being here? That's all I'm saying. She looked through her window and appraised him critically. What are your terms? She had barely gotten the words out when Carl kicked me in the back of the knees. I went sprawling in the lily pond, losing my gun in the muck as I tried to make sense of it. What the hell was going on? Carl was on me then, forcing my hands behind my back as he held me in place. Randy didn't move, but I could sense that Gabe felt a little torn about what was happening. 
Maybe they hadn't brought him in on this part of the plan, but he was in it now, I suppose. Gabriel, I would advise you not to do anything stupid. Sorry, kid, Carl added, almost sounding remorseful. I like you, but this is business. Randy stepped up to cover the old man's left, the place Carl had been a moment before, and Dr. Thurston cast a hand at me, like a game show host, showing off prizes. Meat from my table, just as I have always offered, if you will keep our deal for another year. You're still here. I thought you might be. Thanks for joining me for tonight's story. If your insatiable appetite for horror knows no bounds, might I suggest one of our playlists, or one of our previous stories in the archive? There should be one appearing at the end of the story any minute now. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button? Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If you prefer your horror a little more analog, you can always pick up one of my books. There's a link below to my latest, and it'll take you to all the great things that I've posted on Amazon. For my book lovers in the audience, I always suggest coming on down to Patreon so you can become part of my ghostly reader tier and get a book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. Speaking of my patrons, let's go ahead and thank them. Thanks to Janet for being our spooky skeleton tier contributor, and thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you're thinking you might like to become one of my patrons, follow the link below to my Patreon. And as always, however you support the show, I appreciate it. Till next time, Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.